Bonsoir, good evening. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2021 Albertine Price Award Ceremony. I'm Gaëtan Bruel, cultural counselor of the French Embassy and director of Villa Albertine. It is inspiring to be here with so many fans of contemporary French literature in this audience tonight. In fact, I believe that most of us are here able to read French literature in French, and we are lucky to do so. But at the same time, we must acknowledge all the virtues of translation, and of course, of a great translation. Literature in translation is one of our main focuses, and we are very proud to contribute to its promotion in the United States through the Albertine Prize, which recognizes a French or francophone novel translated into English in the previous year. It is important to us to reward both a writer for his literary work, but also his translator, who played a central role by making his work available to American readers. This prize is also a tribute to our American publisher friends, many of whom are in this room, who take such a serious interest in contemporary French literature, and we are very happy to work with such valuable allies. This year, in order to gather a real community of readers, we chose to offer the vote to the members of Albertine, of our beloved bookstore, our most fervent defenders and worshippers of French literature. For this 2021 edition, our selection committee nominated five novels with distinctive literary styles written by a diverse roster of authors who show the breadth of the French and Francophone contemporary literary scene. Thanks to the selection, we followed the perilous crossing of three migrant women in the Mediterranean, rediscovered post-industrial France through a coming-of-age story, questioned normative sexuality, capitalist culture, and environmental degradation, all of that in one book, <laughs> followed the story of an all-consuming passion between two women, and discovered the fabulous history of a black violin prodigy. What a great program of works. After a month of discovery and exchange around the books, our members made their choice, which we will soon discover. But before they present the award to the lucky winners, I am honored to welcome tonight our distinguished co-chairs of the Albertine Prize, Rachel Kushner and Daniel Mendelssohn. Rachel Kushner, we are very honored to have you with us today as the co-chair of this award for the second year in a row. You have been the only writer to be ever be nominated for a National Book Award in Fiction for both a first, Telex from Cuba, 2008, and second novel, The Flame Throwers, in 2013. In 2018, the French translation of your third novel, The Mass Room, was awarded the Prix Médicis Étranger. As an internationally acclaimed novelist with a strong attachment to French literature and France, we believe that you are the perfect ambassador to bring awareness to the importance of literary translation. Daniel Mendelssohn, as a great connoisseur of French literature, you are the equally ideal choice to represent the Albertine Prize. You embody Albertine's mission through your promotion of contemporary literature as editor-at-large of the New York Review of Books. And thanks to your work, many French authors have had a prominent place on the American literary scene, and for that, we are all grateful. But above all, you are a great writer, acclaimed both in the United States and in France and beyond. Uh, in France, all of, all of your books have been published by Edition Flammarion. You won the Prix Médicis Étranger in 2007 for the French translation of your book, The Lost, a search for six of six million. And in 2020, you released the very poetic, the extraordinary Three Rings, a tale of exile, narrative and fate, which is truly an ode to French literature. Thank you both for being here today and for being valued partners of the Albertine Prize. I would like also to deeply thank our two winners for making the trip to be with us. And don't try to identify who I'm looking at. <laughs> Let's wait a few minutes. We are very happy that you are here tonight to celebrate your book. And I would like also, of course, to acknowledge the other four great authors of the selection whose books really delighted us. 
as well as their talented translators. And as a final note, please allow me to thank those who made this prize possible. I would like to extend a very warm welcome and sincere gratitude to our co-presenters, Van Cleef and Arpels, who have been our most committed partners since Albertine's creation a few years ago. Thanks to you, the $10,000 prize will be shared between the winning author and translator. And it is a pleasure and true privilege to work with you, to have your support in this endeavor and in many others. I would also like to thank the New York Review of Books, our media partner, for their support throughout this project. It was a pleasure working with you. A special thanks to Daniel Mendelssohn, our main ally in this partnership uh, between NYRB and Albertine, which we hope will continue after this prize with many events to promote the best of French literature. And naturally, last but not least, the Albertine Prize would never have been possible without the Albertine Books Foundation. And I would like to warmly thank each uh, one of our board members, starting with our beloved chairman Alain Bernard, alongside a wonderful team at Albertine and at the book department. I will now give the floor to Julie Cran from Van Cleef and Arpels, and then to our co-chairs, Daniel Mendelssohn and Rachel Kirchner, who will present the prize to the winning author and translator. Thank you very much for being with us, and I wish you all a wonderful ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Gaëtan, and good evening, everyone. I'm Julie Kramp, the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Van Cleef & Arpels Americas, and I am thrilled to be here with you in person, finally, and not um, digitally like last year. I hope you can hear me well and not too loud. Um, it is truly our privilege and honor to be here tonight and to support the Alberton Prize. Ever since its founding in 1906 and until today, Van Cleef and Arpels has made it a priority to support the art and culture on both sides of the Atlantic. We take great pride and pleasure in promoting the arts through education with endeavors such as our School of Jewelry Art L'Ecole, but also our cultural partnerships. Our ongoing friendship with Albertine represents really our commitment to furthering the French-American cultural exchanges, and we are so grateful for uh, your friendship, Gaëtan, and to all our friends at Albertine. The Maison finds endless source of inspiration in poetry and literature from Jules Verne to Plato through William Shakespeare, um, which have all given birth to some of our most prized creations. In a very unique way, we feel like we translate literature into precious objects, and we feel a particular kinship to the translators that we're honoring tonight. Uh, we're very proud of our enduring partnership with Albertine and we do treasure inspiring works and authors. We're very happy to contribute in a very humble way um, to cultural exchanges, sorry, <laughs> that literature allows between France and the United States. And we're delighted to toast to tonight's finalists at the Albertine Prize. So on behalf of Van Cleef and Arpels, I look forward to many work, more works of art uh, created and celebrated through Albertine. And I will now introduce Daniel Mendelssohn and Rachel Kushner to come and present the prize. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Daniel Mendelssohn on behalf of the New York Review of Books. We're very happy to be media partners with Albertine for this wonderful event. And I'm now going to read the names of the nominees and the winners. These are the five nominees for the 2021 Albertine Prize. Louis-Philippe d'Alembert, The Mediterranean Wall, published here by Schaffner Press, and in France by Sabine Vespisa, translated by Marjolaine de Jager. Pauline Delabrois Allard, They Say Sarah, translated here, uh, sorry, published here by Other Press, in France by Minuit, and translated by Adriana Hunter. Emmanuel Bayamak Tam, 
Arcadia, Seven Stories Press, and P.O.L., translated by Ruth Diver. Nicolas Mathieu and their children after them, trans, uh, published by Other Press and in France by Acte Sud, translated by William Rodarmour. And finally, Emmanuel Dongala, The Bridge Tower Sonata, Sonata Mulatica, published by Schaffner Press and by Acte Sud, and translated by Marjolin de Jager. It is our great pleasure tonight to announce the winner of the Albertine Prize 2021 and their children after them by Nicolas Mathieu. This is how we choreograph it, and I um, will announce the, the prize is shared with the translator of uh, Nicolas Matu's amazing novel, and that's William Rodarmore, who's also here. Um, yeah. And we're going to have a conversation, but just um, want to say a couple words about the translation of the novel and to say that one has to also comment on the novel itself. Um, this is a book of great amplitude that's written um, in a style that has a grand tradition through um, French writers like Victor Hugo and Balzac and American writers like Melville and John Steinbeck, which is to use exposition to pan out and tell the story of the greater sweep of history and economics and um, you know social factors and race and colonialism and how these things shape people. And then there are people in the book and the book is told in a kind of free indirect discourse inside their thoughts. As a translator to modulate and manage a tone where you go from this grand exposition into people's thoughts and their teenagers. And so the thoughts are very loose and idiomatic and shaped by their attitudes. And to sustain that over the length of a 430 page novel is definitely a very particular skill. And I think that it was done so nicely in this book. <laughs> I'm very glad to be here. Um, I, uh, I achieved maybe a good book, but uh, I didn't achieve to, to learn English very well when I was a kid. Uh, so I'm going to uh, switch in French. <laughs> Merci à, à tous de, pour cette invitation et pour ce prix. Je voudrais remercier naturellement le, le jury. Euh, Rachel Kuchner, Kuchner et Daniel Mendelssohn, bien sûr. Euh, je voudrais remercier évidemment euh, William, qui a traduit euh, ce livre, qui n'était pas une mince affaire, hein, parce qu'il y a des problèmes de traduction qui se posent entre la Lorraine et Paris euh, pour ce livre. C'est-à-dire que chez, chez moi, je ne suis pas toujours très bien compris. Donc j'imagine que pour le porter jusqu'ici, ça, ça, ça a causé quelques ennuis. Thank you all for this invitation and for this prize. I'd like to thank the jury, Rachel Kushner and Daniel Mendelssohn, of course, and I also would like to thank William for translating this book, which was not an easy task because I must say sometimes there are translation problems between Lorraine and Paris. In Paris, I'm not always understood, so to move it all the way here was not an easy thing. Vous venez de démontrer une nouvelle fois que la traduction est parfois meilleure que l'original. You've just shown once again that sometimes translation can be better than the original. Alors, et je voudrais aussi euh, rendre un hommage appuyé à Judith Gourevitch, mon éditrice, qui a eu le mérite euh, 
d'aimer euh, ce livre avant qu'il ait le prix Goncourt. Alors le 8 novembre 2018, tout le monde me trouvait génial, mais le 6, beaucoup moins. C'est pour ça que je voudrais euh, la remercier ce soir. I'd also like to pay a very deep tribute to my editor, Judith Gurevich, who had the merit of liking this novel before it won the Goncourt Prize. So on November 8, 2018, everybody thought I was a genius. On November 6, 2018, not as many. Et puisque j'en ai l'occasion, je voudrais la remercier aussi pour avoir programmé une interview avec le New York Times deux heures après que j'ai reçu le prix. And since I have this opportunity, I'd also like to thank her for scheduling an interview with the New York Times two hours after I received the prize. Je ne me souviens plus très bien des questions qui m'ont été posées à cette occasion, mais je me souviens assez précisément des réponses et c'était oui. I don't so clearly remember the questions that were asked of me during this interview, but I do remember the answers, and they were yes. Merci beaucoup à tous. Good evening. I'm William Rodemore. I am here because Nicolas Mathieu is a writer of genius and a very forgiving one. Every translator dreams of getting it right, and we often do, but not always. And when we don't, we're sorry, and we just hope nobody notices. Anyway, I want to express my appreciation to Albertine to the people on stage who've contributed so much to this exercise. I'm so honored. I mean, there's, it's such a privilege to take a book, a good book, and to transform it into something else that makes it more accessible to other people. It's a gift. And it's such a pleasure and a privilege to have given you this one. Thank you. So we are going to have a little conversation about this wonderful book, and we'll be working with to Nicola, as I understand it. Both of them will be talking. Um, and uh, Rachel and I have uh, been thinking about this book, uh, and we just thought we'd have a conversation. And then after we talk for a little bit, we're going to open up the floor to questions and comments from the audience, because we're sure there are readers and admirers here who have questions of their own. Um, this is a book that uh, as Rachel has already suggested, participates in a great tradition of French literature. And actually, I was thinking quite often as I read it, I, I'm aware that there's a new, um, uh, a new TV adaptation of Germinal right now. And I was thinking often of that book, too, while I was reading this one. And I guess my question is, it, it tells the story of a region that certainly many American readers won't be familiar with. Um, in the East, a sort of post-industrial, rather a, a kind of a Rust Belt uh, climate, uh, through essentially two young men whose lives shadow each other in an interesting way. And so my first question for Nicolas is, uh, and this is, I should also say, a, a territory that Nicolas has visited in his first novel, uh, Aux Animaux, uh, La Guerre. And so my first question really is, what came first? The desire to create another work about this region, about this, uh, as Rachel eloquently described before, the way that history, economy, colonialism, uh, politics impacts the lives of real people. Who came first, the characters or the subject? 
I'm very glad because I understood your question. So I, I, I'm, I can well, I try speak, to I speak, answer. <laughs> I speak very good English. Uh, uh, C'est une très bonne question et je pense que, enfin, en y répondant, euh, je, comment dire, je précise presque un, un postulat esthétique. Ce sont évidemment les personnages qui viennent d'abord. So that's a very good question, and I think that in answering it, I'm going to make very specific a postulate, an aesthetic postulate. It is, of course, the characters that come first. Parce que je, je crois que quand on, on entame un roman en partant de considérations euh, générales, économiques, sociologiques, idéologiques, euh, ou d'une volonté politique de démonstration, on risque de se perdre dans, dans quelque chose qui s'appelle le roman à thèse. Hmm et qui, de ce fait, passe à côté de l'essentiel du pouvoir romanesque, qui est de rendre la vie. Because I think when you start a novel from general considerations that are economic, sociological, or when you want to uh, carry out a political demonstration, you run the risk of losing yourself in what is called a thesis novel, and in doing so, of missing the important essential aspect of the novel which is to show life to render life donc le le point de départ c'est quelque chose de très ténu c'est l'histoire d'un garçon de 14 ans qui voit une fille en maillot de bain sur une plage et qui se dit il faut que ce soit elle et on sent tout de suite que ça va être très compliqué c'est pas forcément ce qui m'intéresse le plus mais ça doit être le point de départ So the starting point is, is something very slim, very simple. It's a 14-year-old boy who sees a, a girl on a beach in a swimsuit, and he tells himself, it has to be her. And we sense that it, it's going to be very complicated for him. And that's not necessarily such an essential thing, but it must be the beginning. Peut-être que maintenant je me dis quelque chose de, de cet ordre, c'est que ce qui compte le plus, c'est ce dont il faut parler le moins et que ce sera dans les intercales, enfin dans les, dans, entre les lignes, euh, dans les espaces intercalaires du texte, que ces choses-là vont, vont surgir et qu'elles euh, seront laissées à la liberté du lecteur. I tell myself now that maybe the most important thing is what you talk about the least. And these are the things that will come up between the lines, in the interstitial spaces, um, the things that are left to the freedom of the reader. Et pour finir, il y a une phrase de, de Proust qui m'avait beaucoup marqué, où il, dans laquelle il parlait de Victor Hugo. Il disait au début, Victor Hugo pensait, au lieu de faire comme la nature, donner à penser. Et alors, j'essaye de donner à penser. There's a sentence by Proust that meant a lot to me um, about Victor Hugo. He said, at the beginning, uh, Victor Hugo thought, instead of doing like nature, which is to give something about which to think, something to think about. And so I try to give something to think about. Um, well, one of the things that I thought a lot about while reading the novel um, was the role that childhood and adolescence plays um, in the life of working people and how different it can be from the role adolescence plays in the life of a bourgeois person. Um, like to summarize that childhood and adolescence of pranks and drinking and riding a Yamaha YZ, which is in the book and the first motorcycle I ever rode, but um, that, these, that this is the real life and it ends when you turn 18 and get a job in a factory and marry a woman and have kids and have responsibilities and that joy is done with. And I was wondering how conscious you were of, of, of these ideas that it's, it's a tribute to childhood but it's also a eulogy of the end of joy in people's lives, at least in this fictional town of Elange. Am I saying it right? Okay. J'en je, étais pas si conscient que ça parce que je me suis pas dit les 
leur, leur jeunesse et leur euh, adolescence est un paradis qui va s'éteindre euh, une fois qu'ils seront adultes. C'est chemin faisant, en dépliant l'histoire et en poussant les personnages, que, que, ça, que cette pente a été prise. Well, I wasn't so conscious of that. I didn't say to myself, um, their youth is a paradise that will be extinguished once they are adults. It's as I was going along, and it's by pushing the characters that that direction started to be taken. C'est vrai que c'est ce que raconte le roman, et on, en, en me parlant de ce, que, de ce roman, on m'a dit récemment, on m'a rapporté une phrase de William Volman qui dit peut-être que la vie n'est qu'un processus dans lequel on échange des espérances contre des souvenirs. Oui, oui, alors je suis pas... C'est vrai que je suis, c est, c est, ça donne pas forcément envie de faire la fête tout de suite, mais... So, it's true, that is what the novel talks about, uh, which makes me think of something that was said to me about my novel recently, which was something that, it was a quote from William Volman, who says, maybe life is a process in which we exchange hopes for memories. It's true that doesn't really make you want to go and party right away, but... <laughs> Et, um, on, on parlait de de, comment dire, de la généalogie dans laquelle s'inscrit ce roman, les, les, les romanciers naturalistes et réalistes français, euh, ou, ou Steinbeck, mais peut-être que ce roman doit aussi beaucoup à un, art, un autre artiste américain euh, qui est Bruce Springsteen, et euh, que cette mélancolie-là était... Je l'ai aussi empruntée à la chanson The River, et, qui raconte aussi l'histoire de toute une existence et qui revient sans cesse à cette rivière comme l'histoire des personnages revient toujours à ce lac au milieu de la vallée. So we were talking about this genealogy of the novel that is uh, coming from the French naturalist and realist novel, also Steinbeck, but perhaps I should also mention another American artist who is Bruce Springsteen, and that the melancholy I have in the novel was borrowed also from the song The River, which tells the story of a whole existence that continues continually returns to this river as the characters in my novel return to the lake in the middle of this valley. One of the remarkable things about this book, it's a, it's a dense and rich story about people who do seem to lose hope to, to, to a certain extent who are, uh, whose dreams are crushed in some way. And yet the novel, don't worry, I'm actually going to be selling this novel, but, <laughs> but, but, and yet there are, in the way that Rachel was mentioning, these evocations of these very intense pleasures, aspirations, joys, fantasies, dreams is a kind of counterbalance to the realities that eventually overwhelm a lot of the people. And I just wanted to ask you to comment on sort of how you, I, I just admired on the level of the writing, the way that you balance these two aspects of these people's lives. There's no sparing of the reality uh, of how these people live and what life does to them. In fact, towards the end of the novel, a character says something like, I feel like I'm a castaway, a stowaway in my own life. Um, and I was just interested in the way that you sort of, as you wrote it, how you negotiated this, these two modes, which one feels very intensely. There are some incredible moments in the novel of just sort of pure adolescent joy And I was just wondering what it was like to sort of be, and two, I have to say, world historical sex scenes. Um, and just how you sort of balance that in the writing of it. Alors effectivement, le, tout le roman euh, tourne, enfin, s'articule autour de ces deux forces contradictoires. D'une part, l'inertie et euh, le couvercle qui pèse sur ces gens, sur cette vallée, mm -hmm. qui s'incarne dans ce lac noir et qui, a, qui attire toute la vie autour comme, une, comme un trou noir, justement. Et puis, 
le désir, l'appétit d'exister qui habite les personnages et qui chacun essaye de s'arracher à son sort sans cesse. It's true, the novel is articulated entirely around these two contradictory forces. On the one hand, this inertia, the lid that, hang, that is coming down on these people and the entire valley, and that's embodied in this dark black lake that seems to suck life towards it like a black hole. And on the other, the desire to exist and to tear yourself away from this. Je pense que mon... Le grand allié que j'ai eu dans, dans, dans cet effort d'émancipation par rapport aux, aux forces qui s'exerçaient sur les personnages, c'était les corps. Alors non seulement euh, l'éveil des sens qui concerne, la, enfin qui s'attache à la, enfin, comment dire, euh, qui va avec l'adolescence, mais aussi euh, de rendre présent au lecteur euh, toutes les sensations liées à l'été, les odeurs, les, les, la chaleur, etc. Je pense que quelle que soit la difficulté qu'on puisse éprouver à être, on peut toujours se réjouir d'avoir un corps pour éprouver. I think that my great ally in this effort, um, in the emancipation of, from these forces that are acting upon us, was bodies. And that, on the one hand, bodies, the awakening of senses that one experiences in adolescence, and then on the other, to make very present to the reader all the sensations of summer, heat, smells, etc. I think that though it can be very hard to live, we can always rejoice in having a body with which to feel. Et c'est pour ça, sans doute, que tout le roman se déroule pendant l'été parce que je savais qu'il me fallait de la lumière pour contrebalancer la noirceur des ouais. forces sociales qui s'appliquaient. And that's probably why the whole novel takes place in the summer because I knew that I needed light to counterbalance the social forces that were weighing on people. About the sex scenes there I just when you said world class it's a late sex scene in the novel two people fucking in the driver's seat of a Clio, which if you've never driven a Clio is a very small car. <laughs> with, a, with a stick shift that keeps getting in the way. Um, But uh, we are also small people, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But the, Stephanie's not so small though, no. in the book. Um, I was wondering, this is a question for Nicolas, but also for his translator, William. Um, in terms of your impressions reading the novel when you first read it in French before it's translated. So, how do I put this? Like from the United States, you know, there was, there's, there's the event of the publication of your book and uh, winning the Prix Goncourt. And like, there's the phenomenon of um, my friend Edouard Louis writing books about the, about the North, about the, you know, the area that he comes from. And this, what seems from far away, like a sudden French preoccupation with fascination with novels that take into account the inner lives of working class people in France and the way that they've been shortchanged. And a look at these books, um, and, I'm hoping that they'll go some way to explain the total hatred of people like Emmanuel Macron, for instance, and the phenomenon of the Gilets Jaunes, and et cetera. But like reading your book, I was thinking, in film, we're more familiar with having heard from people outside of Paris. You know, like Bruno Dumont's film, The Life of Jesus. This is a, like a very, very important film to me, and I was wondering if it is to you. And I was wondering also if literature is kind of behind film in a way, in terms of capturing um, a more diverse set of people's lives because it's so based in Paris. But I don't know, tell me, and also after then, William, do you want to talk about your impressions when you first read the book in French? Alors oui, effectivement, Bruno Dumont, il y a un avant et un après dans ma vie. C'est-à-dire que j'étais étudiant en histoire, j'ai vu l'humanité, 
Et l'année suivante, j'étais étudiant en cinéma. Donc, euh, ça vous donne une idée d'à quel point il a, il a influencé euh, à la fois mon travail et, et, ma, et, et mon envie de, 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 de créer. Enfin, voilà, si tant, si tant est qu'on puisse dire ça. Euh, lui, Piala et d'autres qui ont effectivement, euh, on se soucie de, de montrer la réalité brute. Pas seulement, mais, mais de faire ça, de rendre la, ces réalités-là. Yes, in my life, there is a before Bruno Dumont and an after Bruno Dumont. Uh, to give you, to make it very clear, I was a history student when I saw Dumont's film L'Humanité, and the next year I was a film student. So that gives you an idea of the influence he had on my work and my desire to make art. Uh, Dumont, Piala, others really have this desire, this intention to show raw reality. Not just that, but that's a very important part of it. Je ne sais pas pourquoi ces sujets tout à coup sont devenus d'une si brûlante actualité, pourquoi il y a eu des, ils ont donné lieu à des succès, je ne sais pas. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y avait un souci plus grand tout à coup de cette France-là Est-ce que les gilets jaunes, le succès d'Edouard Louis est antérieur de toute façon Après, il y a une autre question qui tourmente beaucoup les Français, c'est celle des transfuges de classe, c'est-à-dire du, du passage d'un monde à l'autre, parce que euh, je pense que ça fait partie de l'idée qu'on se fait du pacte républicain, que, que ce pacte est, a, a connu de, beaucoup d'avaries et que, que, que les... Les écrivains qui témoignent de mondes auxquels ils ont pu s'arracher, ça passionne aujourd'hui. I don't know why these particular subjects seem so intensely contemporary and important nowadays and, and why these kinds of works are having the success they're having now. I really don't know and, and how that echoes with the Gilets Jaunes movement. Uh, anyhow, Edouard Louis' success had come before the Gilets Jaunes. I think there's also something there about the very important idea in France of moving across class lines. This is an idea that's very important to us as being part of the Republican pa pact and that tr um, troubles us a lot. So writers who deal with um, characters who are able to tear themselves out of their class have a real resonance or are very fascinating to people. I think I'll answer two aspects of the question. One of the things that I found compelling about the book when I encountered it was this hot house in which the characters exist. And I was fascinated by the fact that some were clearly trapped and others kind of like Hawking radiation escaping from a black hole, somehow escaping, not always successfully, but bursting free, which of course gives you hope and a, a, a measure of despair when you look at the others who do not. Now, I am no person to talk about class or social, social behavior in France. I don't know it well enough. But I want to say that as a translator, it's enormously challenging to translate a book about people I don't know. I mean, look, I am an overeducated white guy with a rent-controlled apartment in Berkeley, California. I've never even seen a steel mill. But when you start reading a book like this, there's something in the way, in, in the way your mind shifts. And I think maybe that's just a characteristic of, of great novelists in general. You become interested in these people. People you will never meet, people you will probably never quite understand, mm -hmm. but there's something compelling about it. And so it's not really translation. It's a form of literary addiction. I, I, I want to make sure it's just very frustrating because there are things I want to say, but I can't say them because I don't want to give away the end of the novel, <laughs> particularly relative to this idea of, of you know, moving from class to class. I mean, I will say that 
this without, I hope, giving too much away, that this novel seems to me to set itself against a certain tradition of particularly 19th century novels. One thinks of Illusion Perdue, for example, you know, where of the, the grand success story of the, man, the boy from the provinces who comes to Paris and makes it. And in fact, what's interesting about this novel, I think, is that Paris is, is sidelined completely in this novel. It's the place where people don't have any fun, you know, <laughs> basically. And I think that's so interesting. You know, was that conscious? You know, the, Paris has a very, I think, almost comic role in this novel. Uh, and I was just wondering, was that, I assume that was deliberate. You know, people, everyone dreams of being, and in fact they say, oh, you know, then they'll think I'm a Parisienne or a Parisien. But you seem deliberately to keep cutting that off. Oui, en tout cas, je, je savais qu'il y aurait un, un rapport d'attraction-répulsion de, de, yeah. avec euh, cette ville. Yeah. Et Anthony, comme Steph, s'y rendent. Et tous, ceux, tous deux, ils, ils vivent des expériences cuisantes. Voilà. Oui, je savais qu'il y aurait une attraction-répulsion relation avec cette ville. Et les deux, Anthony et Steph, vont là et ont des expériences expériences. Finalement, on pourrait dire que ce sont des anti-rastignacs. C'est-à-dire, eux, ils ne disent pas à nous de Paris, ils disent « Paris nous a eus <rire> ». Ultimately, you could say that they are anti-rastignacs. They can't say « Paris will belong to us » or « we will have Paris, but Paris got us ». Et euh, qu'est-ce que je voulais dire Non, j'ai perdu le fil. Euh... Uh, well, I just, well, I also, so this book uh, does sort of follow these two young men from 1992 to 1998. But to me, some of the most wonderful things about this book are the adults, these, the, the parents, the aunts, the uncles. I can't remember reading a more gripping and persuasive account of middle-aged people who are already, you know, sort of at the end point of the trajectory that Rachel described before. There's this sort of the sense that adolescence is where you have all your fun and then the, the dreariness sets. And I was just thinking, who are these people to you? They seem so unbelievably concrete, the mother, the mother and the father. You know, I started by asking, do you start with the characters or the, the Tez, you know? But I, I almost want to say, I think that you started thinking about the, the, the parents before you thought about the boys. Alors, non, et euh, a, ces personnages-là sont, se sont développés presque malgré moi euh, dans, le, dans le fil de l'écriture. Il y a beaucoup de choses qui se produisent dans un roman, en tout cas de la manière dont, dont moi j'écris, je, 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 qui, qui, qui paraissent délibérées et ont faim de les avoir décidées et qui finalement se produisent au fil de la plume en dépliant l'histoire, en poussant les personnages. Et les adultes ont pris beaucoup de poids à mesure que j'écrivais. No, those characters nearly developed despite myself in the writing. There's a lot that happens in a novel, at least in the way that I write, that seems deliberate, but that actually happens as the pen moves across the page, that, that happens as the writing unfolds, and that's how those characters took on weight. Et finalement, les ados de leurs enfants après eux euh, avaient commencé à exister dans le roman pré précédent, Aux animaux la guerre, avec deux personnages d'ados qui avaient fait leur apparition un peu spontanément sans que je le décide. Et il est bien possible que les personnages d'adultes, ces quadras qu'on voit dans leurs enfants après eux, soient poursuivis d'une autre manière, par d'autres moyens, dans le roman suivant. Actually, the teens in this novel started their existence in my previous novel, whose title I wrote down, Aux animaux la guerre, 
to animals, the war, um, there were two teens who appeared spontaneously in that novel without my having decided so. And ultimately, it may happen that the middle-aged people in this novel will appear in my next novel. Uh, two questions. I guess I'll start with Nicola and then I have a question with the translator. Um, so in terms of setting this book in the 90s, um, it's, it, really, it really maps on to what I think of as um, like the real shift into finance capital and the way that it has determined many outcomes for many people globally. But as I'm reading the book, I'm aware of, for instance, 2005 in France, you know, um, with the revolts in the Banyu. And I'm aware of 2006 with the CPE, et cetera. And so like all of this is kind of waiting to unfold and happen. And I was wondering, um, you know, I, knowing your age, it maps onto a time that you, you would be able to plunge with great authority into the particularities of someone who was coming of age in the 90s. But did you also choose that time because you wanted to kind of, I don't know, I guess, look at it in reticulated detail for what later evolved out of it in terms of the closing of these factories. And there's a lot in the book about um, the repurposing of old factories. Like first, people lose their job at the steel mill, but then they can get hired back uh, doing demolition of the mills, which also happened in the United States. Uh, like I knew people who got jobs dismantling ships and navy yards that had been closed. And then there's like this funny stuff about kind of, you know, like the revitalized waterfront phenomenon and the shopping mall and the way you're supposed to be retrained for new work without any of the former work guarantees that were kind of part of the f contract of French citizenship. So anyway, I was wondering, did you choose that time in order to map all of this, or does it just happen to be when you were young? <laughs> Alors en général, je fais semblant de l'avoir choisi pour des raisons, euh, comment dire, euh, significatives. C'est-à-dire effectivement le, le basculement d'un monde à l'autre, cette parenthèse entre entre le, le monde de l'affrontement du bloc de l'est et du bloc de l'ouest, et puis le 11 septembre, etc. Mais à la vérité, c'était quand même par commodité que j'ai choisi euh, cette période. In general, I pretend that I chose this period for significant or meaningful reasons. This kind of interlude, this, this shift from one world to another, when you have the interlude from the end of the conflict between East and West to the 9-11, uh, but the truth is that I really chose it out of convenience. <laughs> je savais que je voulais parler de l'adolescence, et si j'avais dû situer ça de nos jours, toute l'économie amoureuse du roman aurait été changée parce qu'il y, y a 400 pages de, de vie adolescente et pas un seul écran. <laughs> I knew that I wanted to write about adolescence, and if I had set the film today, the entire romantic economy of the novel would have been entirely changed because um, I have 400 pages of teenage love and not a single screen. <laughs> Donc, ça aurait supposé que je mène une enquête et que je rencontre des jeunes, et qui veut s'imposer ça? And, <laughs> That would have required me to investigate, to meet young people, and who wants to have to do that? Okay, so speaking of that, that ex perfectly cues my question for William. So, I, like, um, sadly, I don't really speak French, but I live with people who do. My son speaks French, and when he's talking to his friends, they do not speak the kind of French that I could learn in my French book. It's uh, all idioms. So in translating a book that has the thoughts of teenagers that are very much shaped by the social world they live in with their friends, like even when you're alone, um, the thoughts that you're having and that are rendered so believably in this book 
have a tone and attitude that, you know, it's teenage world. So in order to figure out what they were saying, did you plunge yourself into kind of, and it would have to be teen culture in France in the 90s, because these expressions change. Well, <laughs> listen, that's, that is the, the hardest sort of thing. I mean, the other hard things are jokes, and the other ultimate hard thing, of course, is sex, because none of it is, translates very well. I tend to think sex is probably better in French, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, the, you know, it's hard, and the fact that it's hard is what, is what makes it interesting. I mean, I could translate easier books. I'd rather translate hard ones. You know, I honestly don't remember how I captured teen, teen speak. I got, I was very flattered. Uh, the, I think the Los Angeles Review of Books complimented the translation on its teen sociolect. <laughs> that guy's a French professor too. I saw uh, that review. I, I thought sociolect was something that you did between consenting adults. <laughs> You know, I can't answer the question, but I don't know. I remember thinking hard about it, trying to remember my own, my own youth, which was mainly in, in France, and making some lucky guesses. Mm. What can I say? Mm. I'm incredulous that our time for our conversation is actually up, but I'm, I'm sure there are a couple of questions from the audience that we can entertain for both the author and the translator. Um, yes, there's a gentleman in the back. That's a tough one. <rire> euh, moi, je viens du, du roman noir, du roman policier. Et si j'ai commencé par ce bout-là de la littérature, c'était sans doute avec un, un fantasme politique qui était d'écrire des romans populaires sur le peuple. Et que le peuple, enfin, ces gens, les gens des classes populaires, pourraient, auxquels ils pourraient accéder eux aussi. Well, I come from the detective novel, and if I started with that, it's probably because I had a political fantasy to write popular novels about the people, novels that the people could access. Et euh, quand euh, je faisais des rencontres comme ça avec ce, ce premier roman noir, souvent je disais ça euh, comme un statement, et euh, une, une éditrice, un, un soir, euh, après avoir beaucoup bu, m'avait dit « Vous me faites marrer, vous les auteurs de Polar ». Vous croyez que vous écrivez des, des livres pour le peuple, mais vous savez, à la fin, il n'y a jamais que des bourgeois qui vous lisent. And so when I used to participate in events like this and, and meet audiences with my first noir novel, I would say statements like the one I just made. And one time, an editor who had had a lot to drink said to me, you know, you really make me laugh, you detective novel writers. You always think that you're writing for the people, but actually, you're just writing for bourgeois people. Donc, quand, quand elle a savoir comment ce roman affecte les gens dont il parle, je, je serais extrêmement modeste. 
Je pense que ça les affecte très peu et que ça ne change en rien leur existence. Mais, as to how this novel, <laughs> as to how this novel affects the people that it talks about, I will be very modest and say that it affects them very little. But, à un niveau intime, et pour certaines personnes, certains gamins qui tomberont dessus, qui ont 17 ans, comme j'ai eu 17 ans dans ces mondes-là, pour quelques personnes, peut-être que ça allumera une mèche dans leur cerveau. Peut-être que la description du monde qui y est faite les dessillera, leur permettra de voir les forces qui s'exercent sur eux avec plus d'acuité et leur permettra finalement d'accroître leur pouvoir d'émancipation. But on a private level, and for some kids who may come across this novel, some 17-year-olds who may fall upon it like I did in these kinds of worlds, it might light a fuse in their mind. It might allow them to see more clearly and to see the forces that are acting on them and to increase their power of emancipation. J'interviens quand même assez régulièrement dans, auprès des scolaires, dans des collèges, dans des lycées. Et on sait qu'on ne convaincra pas tous les gamins qui sont là de se mettre à lire. Mais il suffit qu'il y en ait un, en fait. Et c'est le, le même genre d'ambition que j'ai avec ce livre. Et il suffirait d'allumer une ou deux mèches dans une ou deux têtes. I regularly do workshops in middle schools and high schools, and we know very well that we're not going to convince all the kids to start reading. But really, if we just convince one kid to read, and I have that same kind of ambition for this novel, all I need is to light one or two fuses in people's minds. Can I make a comment in response to that question, just quickly? Just as a novelist myself, you had me thinking, um, this is a, like a beautiful space at a posh address on Fifth Avenue, um, but if that were to require us to only talk about books full of posh, rich people, that would be really depressing. Um, literature is a, has a very special role, and film too, which I'm thinking of a lot in reading this novel. Art is not activism. It can include the mechanics of the world um, and account for certain like class and race differences, but it has a special role in our lives. And if the people who are here tonight are not from you know, the grim north post-industrial area of France, they can still read a book and have a transcendent experience And maybe they've had people in their lives who are like the people in the book. The character Patrick is like my father-in-law um, who died a long time ago at the old age of 44. So, you know, I think not to, you know, sound too defensive, but like n n novels do many things that happen privately and over the long life of the book because you don't know who's going to find that book and read it and what kind of experience they're going to have. I want to say something about the book. Um, I came here thinking maybe I'd have time to read an excerpt from it, and really, I don't. But I want to tell you about what I was going to read and tell you why it found, I found it so hypnotic. There's a scene where the two boys confront each other. Hassin has stolen and burned Anthony's father's racing motorcycle. This is a grim moment of confrontation. And Anthony steals a scooter, goes up to the projects, pulls a gun out of his backpack, and points it at Hassin. It is, this is a book that is full of moments, but this is the one that I, who know the book somewhat better than Nicolas, <laughs> I mean, look, He wrote it sentence by sentence. I, I translated it word by word. <laughs> <laughs> This is the one that I, who know the book somewhat better than Nicolas, I mean, look, he wrote it sentence by sentence. I, I translated it word by word. 
This was a book, that, this was a moment that mesmerized me because what he does is he describes the moment when Anthony gently puts some pressure on the trigger, decides that now is the time he's going to do it. He's waited. He thinks about what will happen. The bullet will emerge from the muzzle, will hit Hassin's skull in less than a 30th of a second. It'll make a hole about this big, and in its passage will destroy the things that make Hassin who he is. It will exit in a mass of blood and bone. And just then, just then, when I am on the edge of my chair, the scooter that he drove up on stalls. And suddenly, you know, the moment is lost. And the shooting is lost. And the moment is lost. And everything changes. But I swear, and I guess I'm a, I'm a, I'm a careful reader, but any reader would find themselves actually hanging in the air, suspended in our disbelief. Bien fait. Thank you. <laughs> I think with that wonderful, uh, may I say, appetizer about the book, it would be a great moment to move to the actual appetizers, which await us outside, and thank both the author and the translator for this wonderful work. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the best.